Welcome, everybody. Um, the people in the back of the room, um, up here in front, there are a, few, so a little bit space left. So if you want to move to the front, um, this would be the chance. Otherwise, I would like to ask you to close the door so we have it at least a little bit quiet in here. And uh, yeah, if someone wants to move to the front, now is the chance. So we wait a few seconds. Okay, um, a lot of people in the room. So um, welcome from our side. Um, my name is Ansgar Brauner. With me is Sebastian Gauder. We both work as software architects at Rewe Digital. Um, we've been here last year and since then a few times because last year we started opening uh, or we opened a uh, development division here in Sofia. So um, I know the city, but I don't know the country. And uh, today we want to tell you th something about how we use Apache Kafka to distribute data between our microservices and why we think it's better to have the data than to need it on the request time. And um, the main takeaway from this talk should be um, how eventing helps us to reduce the synchronous dependencies in our distributed system so we can um, we have a more resilient infrastructure and more resilient services um, running. First, I want to tell you a little bit about our history and about the company we are working in. Um, the Rave Group is quite a big enterprise. It's more than 54 billion uh, turnover last year. It's more than 330,000 people working there um, all over Europe. It's 15, it has 15,000 shops all over Europe. Um, it's not only food retail. It's also a very big tourism brand, and we ha also have do-it-yourself do do stores. Um, and the company was founded in 1927, so a history of more than 90 years. Um, to get an impression uh, which companies are in this group organized, I, I brought a, a few logos with us, so um, there's probably one. Uh, company you already realize because the brand Billa is also active in Bulgaria. Um, the other ones are mostly in Austria, Germany. Um, yeah, so, and in 2014, we founded the Rewe Digital, which is a digital hub for, for this big enterprise. And the main purpose is to build the onli online business in food delivery and um, start thinking new about the ways we, we want to work and getting new ideas into the enterprise. Um, at Rewe Digital, we have offices in Cologne, which is the main base. We also have an office in uh, Berlin, in Vienna, our connections to the uh, development divisions, and as I said, already uh, here in Sofia. Um, where do we come from inside the Rewe Digital? This is something we want to tell you so you get the idea why we did all the things we will tell you. And, um, why we moved into microservices and why we found those solutions we, we will present. Um, in 2014, we took over um, a monolithic shop software, a monolithic co commerce system, which was handled by two teams in the very beginning. Um, we, re we realized very soon that this won't be sufficient for, for further growth. So um, later, 2014, we decided to hire the first architect and one of the first tasks was um, how can we enable growth in sof uh, software-wise, service-wise, but also in an organizational way. How can we handle the growth inside the company, inside the development uh, department especially. Um, he came up with the idea of microservices, which was already popular at this time, um, and also an organizational pattern to this microservice world, which organizes the teams uh, along the customer journey in domains and subdomains, uh, which you might know from the domain-driven design, um, to, to handle those uh, things independently from each other. Um, later in 2015, we decided to that the running the services inside the data center and running the services as a Debian package is not working anymore. So there were more and more teams coming up 
and uh, the deployments took a lot of, lot of time. There need to be a lot of preparation for the deployments and stuff like this, so we decided to move to Docker and, and use Docker Swarm. Um, it was a, um, was a decision we made to use Docker in the first place because we wanted to know this technology, get to know this technology before we put even more technologies on there like Kubernetes and stuff like this. Right now we are moving into the Google Cloud, so there will be a Kubernetes cluster running which is still containers but uh, not Docker and Docker Swarm anymore. In 2016, beginning around spring, we launched the, uh, the shopping service app where you can order food for, for, for delivery. This was the first product which was launched on the microservice infrastructure. We have grown to about 20 teams, so you see there it starts taking off. And um, later, later 2016, we, we've grown further to about 30 teams, and we decided to split the organization into two what we call platforms. So there was an, an e-commerce platform taking the, the software which was already there. Uh, there was a new fulfillment platform founded to, uh, which takes care of logistics. And we found it also a big data platform which of course takes, uh, takes care of big data and analytics and stuff like this. Um, late in 2017, we launched the beta of the marketplace after quite a short uh, development time and the go live was beginning of 2018. We've grown to more than 50 teams or around 50 teams right now. And currently we are launching a new warehouse type in Cologne, which has partly automated parts in it. So, um, and this is the Food Fulfillment Center 2.0. The launch is currently ongoing. Um, to get an impression what this means on a technical level and put the teams beside this, you can see we started with one service and two teams working on the monolith and we grow up to about 200 services and more, uh, 51 teams. Um, changes slightly, so it might be 49 or 52. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what does it mean to scale at a service level? And when we have um, 45 or 50 teams developing services and run more than 200 services, um, the first question I want to ask is imagine what happens if all of those services talk to each other. This is very easy in the microservice 101 lecture you might get online or here on other conferences, but as soon as we start scaling out, you see the communication between all those services gets really, really heavy, and imagine you have 200 services. Um, services are talking to more than three other services at request time. Then you get a lot of communication in your internal network, and you get also the problem that um, if you have chaining HTTP requests, um, the, um, the original request comes in in service one here, and if this service has to make, uh, has to make calls to other services um, and relies on those calls, the, re the, re uh, sorry, the response times add up, and um, if some, something goes wrong, then um, yeah, you probably don't know what even went wrong because there's a layer of other services in between. Of course, you can handle this. Um, you can have strict timeouts on your services. You can have fallback implementations running, so you have default uh, methods running, and you can have uh, circuit break breakers in place um, if it takes too long. And um, we have all those uh, things in place, but we came up also with another solution we call eventing, which prevents a lot of communication in the first place. Okay, so what do we mean by Eventing, the next few slides are about what our interpretation of eventing is. So the, the main goal is to enable the services to provide themselves with, with data before the request happens to their service. So imagine you have these three services here. They all have their REST interface. And now, uh, obviously, service B needs data from the services A and C. And instead of calling them directly when, when, when the request comes in, it consumes the, the, the data that which is which is based in the in the in the databases of services A and C and it consumes them and it just has one copy of, of this data available and when the request comes in it can just go th straight to their to their own database instead of calling other services. So this is kind of a database replication and what we gain from that is more performance because yeah well the touching my own database is cheaper than touching one and, and 
another services database, and it's more stable because if uh, services A and C go down, service B is still able to fulfill uh, the request. What has this to do with eventing? Um, one good um, specification of an event is by Eric Evans. You might know him from, from the uh, d domain driven design books he wrote. Uh, and this uh, definition says um, event is a representation of something that happened in the domain. And it's very important that it's past tense because event is only something that already happened and not something that is about to happen right now or, or will happen in the future. And event basically uh, has, has two concerns. First, the domain entity, which is in our case, as we are dealing with e-commerce, it's a customer, shopping cart, or an order. And you have a state change that happens to this entity. For example, a uh, customer gets registered, an item is added to the shopping cart, or an order is fulfilled. And the, the event has two functions on the, on the, on the first hand side. We have, you have uh, a functional object, which just describes your domain. And it's something that's it's cool because you can talk to the, to the, to the um, functional people, to, 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 the, to the business people. And you can talk about them, about events. And they understand what the event is. And you understand it as well because it's also a technical um, thing. And on the other hand, the event is a vehicle for database replication. So the theory says, if I'm collecting all the events that another service has published, then I'm able to re reproduce the whole database state in my database. From a technical point of view, in, in our case, a database consists of, of these uh, subjects. First, we have an ID, which is just the unique identifier, so I can keep all my events apart. Second, you have a key, which mostly is the key of the entity I'm dealing with. So if you assume that all your entities have an ID, then the, the key of the event is also the ID of this entity. Then you have a version that's pretty important because the publisher and the consumer have to uh, track the versions of each entity they have produced. Then you have the time, so you want to, the, the, the consumer wants to know when did this event occur, and that's not necessarily the same time the event is consumed, but it can happen sometime before. You have the type, which basically says what happened to this, uh, to this entity. For example, something could be added or deleted or updated or something. And then you have the payload where all the details go. And um, this is, in our case, it's a, it's a JSON uh, document. You see it over, over here. And um, the, the payload is not just the, the deltas of the, of the change that's coming in. And that's a big difference to event sourcing, you, you might know. In our case, we need to have all the data from this entity in this message. And, it, and, and every, every event contains the whole entity. Anska will later explain why this is necessary in our case. So just a small example. Uh, imagine you have a customer data service that's dealing with, with customer's data. It has, it has its own database, and it has a REST interface where the clients can get and put data into. And now every time this a customer gets a change of the, of, of the data, it um, also publishes its event to a uh, customer topic or uh, customer queue. And then imagine you have something like an invoice service that's uh, capable of writing an invoice for a customer that also needs exactly the same data because it needs to know who it is and which address he, he has. Then this service just subscribes to this, to this topic and, and uh, receives all the events regarding this uh, consumer data. And imagine if you, have a, you have a second service, uh, let's say a loyalty service, which deals with uh, some loyalty program, and it also needs the same data. So in this state, it's just some kind of simple database replication. But what you can also do is um, imagine this is the, the, the payload. We have a name, a loyalty ID, and two type of addresses, an uh, invoice address and a delivery address. Then the invoice service might only be interested in the name and the invoice address. So it's, it's kind of a filter. He doesn't need to copy the whole database, but just the part of that that's interesting for him. And the loyalty service on the other side uh, is only interested in the name and the loyalty ID. So this is quite a simple approach, which sounds kind of easy, but uh, there are some pitfalls, which we almost all uh, fell into. So I'll give you a short overview of what, what can happen in this world. Uh, the first requirement we have is that events must be self-contained. And that basically means that 
after I have consumed an event, I have to be in a persistent state afterwards, pretty much like in a database transaction. And that, most of all, means you don't have to make further synchronous calls to get your data. So something, uh, as, as shown here, uh, where a URL is given where all the details are, that's just not uh, make sense in this case. And you, you even um, must not consume any more events to, to, to keep your, uh, uh, to, to get your da date consistent. Um, and that's a, that's a problem, it's called transaction completeness. And I will give you an example of what happens if you have your state divided into two events. So this is a, a real life sample from, from our business. Um, we are dealing with uh, delivering food to customers doorstep. And we have uh, stores, and each store is, um, is capable of, of um, several um, zip codes. So in, in, in this case, store one delivers food to the zip codes you, you see here. So if you want to design events for this case, it might be something like this. So it's a very simple style of event. The store is your key, and in the payload is just a list of zip codes which these, this store delivers to. Now imagine uh, something changes and a new store pops up, which is now um, responsible for delivering food to the second zip code. If you now want to express this, this state change, you need two events. In the first event, you need to uh, delete the second zip code from store one, and in the second one, you need to add this, the zip code to the second store. But unfortunately, now your state change is in two events, and this is bad because what might happen, somebody that consumes these messages will consume them after another. And even if it's a very short amount of time, in this um, amount of time, it's just bad things can happen because if, we, if the consumer consumes the first, the first event first, then the second zip code isn't distributed at all, and in the second case, it's distributed twice. So this is not a, a good approach for this. So, what you have to do here is just to turn it around. So if the, if the events contain the zip code as an entity and the, and the store just as the payload, then you can design it like this. And this is fine, you have two events here, but it's just the initial state. You have to build up, and, and after that, the, the, the clients are coming. And if you now have, have this state change, you just need one event to fill the state change. And after that, you're again in a consistent state. So this is pretty tricky. and Having a good event design is not super easy. Second requirement is um, that we only want true facts to be published and committed. So if you have a, a publishing uh, service, it... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> if you have the, the publishing service, it receives some, uh, some uh, data changes via its uh, REST interface then it first has to store it into its own database and then publish to the topic. Because when it's done the other way around, when you first publish it, then it might happen that your database is down and you can't store it, and then you publish a fact that is not true, some kind of alternative fact, which is quite popular in some places of the world, but uh, not in our case. Um, and on the other side, you have the subscribing service which consumes some data, and then it first has to store it into its own database, and first, when it's safe and persistent, then you commit it, and commit means something like, I've read this event, give me the next one. So this is something that's just done sometimes wrong and leads to funny, uh, funny bugs in the, in the system. Then something that is especially important for us is that um, we need to associate events with a root entity. If you have an aggregation, something like this, so we have a shopping cart and some line items, then this is an aggregate. You might heard this term from uh, domain-driven design. It basically means that a line item without a shopping cart is pretty useless, and a shopping cart without line items as well. So they are always connected together, and we need them to be published in the same event. So you have an example here. You have this um, shopping cart, JSON, and then there are all the line items in there. And every time just one line item changes, or just the amount of one line item changes, we need to publish the whole event again with all the lists of the, of the line items in there. And the main reason for that is we make use of log compaction. This is something Ansgar will explain later. And that basically means that we only keep the last version in our, 
in our lock. Because in, in this case, it might happen that this shopping cart has 50 or 100 versions in the end, and we're only interested in the very last yeah, state. So we can get rid of all the first versions, and we save a lot of uh, space by doing this. So this seems quite a good approach, but there are some reasons not to use this, this approach. The first two are pretty obvious. Uh, first one is um, writing operations. So eventing only substitutes get operations. It's only a style of getting data from somewhere else, not writing co uh, data to some other service. If I want another service to write something, then I need to have to use REST APIs or whatever. Second thing is a communication with clients. I think it's pretty obvious we don't connect Kafka to, so to, to a browser or an um, app device or something. Um, these services have classic re request response uh, communication. And the third thing is a little bit tricky. That's um, if you have a time critical data flow, it may come to eventual consistency. And that basically means that even though these databases marked with A are synchronous to each other, it might happen, uh, it, it takes just a short amount of time if the synchronity is really taking place. And if something happens during this phase of synchronization, um, this, this, this can lead to problems. And again, we have a sample from real life. Um, this is unfortunately in German, but I think you will understand it as well. This is the second step of our checkout process where you have to enter your address. We, we, we need the customer's address because we want to drive the stuff to his doorstep. So he needs to enter his address. And in the third step, the customer may choose a time frame when he wants to be delivered. And now the problem is that um, if you... Uh, you, 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 you uh, Enter your address in the second step, and the, and the result of that leads to different results in the, in the choice of time frame. So this is, there's a direct dependency of that. So imagine if, if, that, if this would be done by, by eventing, then it might happen that, that the third step of the checkout process is rendered, but the event hasn't yet arrived. So that's a problem. Then you, we have to display an error message or something and tell the customer to reload or so. Or so. So in this case, it's better to have a classic synchronous communication to just avoid these uh, eventual consistency problems. So I will move on with uh, how we implement these mechanisms. Um, as you already heard, we chose Apache Kafka to do, th to do so. Um, who of you already knows Apache Kafka? And who of you runs it in production? Uh, quite a few, okay. So, but there were a lot of people not raising their hands. We will have a short introduction about what Apache Kafka is and um, what you can do with it. So, um, basically, Apache Kafka is an open source streaming and a stream processing platform written in Scala and Java. Um, it's optimized for high throughput, low latency, and um, it enables uh, real data streams. It was originally developed at LinkedIn. It was open sourced in 2011. And um, on the low level side, it offers four APIs. One for the producers, one for consumers, um, another API for streams, and an API called Kafka Connect. Um, in our place, we, or in our cases, we usually uh, use Apache Kafka in a pub sub manner. Um, so we are relying on the producer and consumer um, APIs very heavily. Um, the first question is what should you send or what should the developer send, the services send as a message? Um, in general, the answer is everything you store as a resource. So um, if, you have, if you provide a REST API and this REST API handles some resources, all of those resources should be published to their own topic. Um, later on, every state change of those resources should be published as an event to the same topic with the same key. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, those events are sent as messages to topics, as I said, and the tricky part is you don't have, or the, the nice part is you don't have to take care about topics and topic creation. There is a default um, configuration there where you can create topics when the first event arrives on the, on the Kafka broker. Um, topics um, are organized in 
partition. This is what we come, uh, come in a few seconds to. So we send ev domain events to topics, as Sebastian stated, an order, a card, a customer. Um, the, uh, the nice part is we have one producer and we have many subscribers to those, uh, to those topics. Um, in the beginning, probably none, but in the end, we don't care how many subscribers there are for a topic. Um, topics are split into partitions, and the, the important part here is the order of events is only guaranteed within one partition. And this leads to, um, to, to uh, um, one key thing, that the ID of your entity should not change. So you make sure all the events related to one entity are always um, on the same partition and always in the correct order. Um, you have a sequential ID assigned to your, to your messages, and those partitions can be distributed over the cluster, and you can configure um, a, a number of replicas for each partition, so you can say um, every, every message should be rep replicated on three nodes or um, as many as you want. You can also configure Kafka the way that it um, accepts a mes message or the, the producer um, takes a message as granted if it's written by at one partition or in all replicas, so you can ensure that the data consistency is, um, is very high here. Um, as Sebastian mentioned, um, if you imagine a shopping cart, and our shopping carts are a little bit different than when you shop fashion and you shop uh, three, four, five items in your basket. Our baskets are usually 40, 50, maybe 100 items um, big, so we have a lot of changes to those baskets, and this means in the end there would be 100 versions of, of the basket event on, on the Kafka broker stored, and um, there the log compaction comes, uh, comes into place. The log compaction takes care that only the latest version of the, the message is still on the broker, and from time to time the bro broker um, compacts those logs and removes all the messages which are not used anymore. So in this case, all of the most recent version, or all message with a certain, certain time to live um, will stay in the, in the, in the Kafka logs. Um, this also means, and this is another difference to event sourcing, there is no point in time access to the data. So when you, when you think about event sourcing and you say, I want to um, reconsume everything from, from such a topic and I have every state change in there, then I could say, how does the system look like two weeks ago? And our system is not able to deal with this because we don't have this requirement in the system. Um, we decided to go the other way and we used this log compaction to remove all those intermediate states we are not interested in anymore. Um, yeah, as we, as we stated several times, choose the key for your entity wisely. Um, so uh, the key should not change. If it's the same entity, it should be the same key because only this can ensure that you have the same entity always on the same partition and the order is granted on those uh, in, in, in those petitions. As I said, every service which owns a resource should publish those resources um, to a topic. Um, even, if in, if, even if the team knows there's no consumer for this, for this topic right now, it's um, a little bit the same with other APIs. We want to offer the future services we might build to get this data very easily, and we don't want to implement a producer um, when a team comes up and says, I'd like to have this data, but it's not available. Um, so we encourage all our teams to, to produce everything they own directly to, the, uh, to, to Kafka topics. Um, there's one tricky part in here. We decided to use only one producer, so there's only one service producing events to a certain topic. The resource owner is the only producer for a topic. Um, if you have multiple producers from different services, um, you also get in, in, in trouble about the order of events, and you might be able to take care of this, but um, for us it's, it's sufficient to have only one producer, one service producing, um, so we can ensure this very easily. Um, yeah, I said the log compaction uses also the, uh, the event keys, so um, only events with the same key will be compacted. Um, another reason to, to deal with this this way. 
And um, there's one request we, um, we state to all the consumer, to all the producers, sorry. Um, all the teams have to implement the functionality to be able to republish all the events from their database. Um, this, is, this comes historically from the perspective that Kafka is not a database backend for us, it's just a transport layer. And we did not secure the Kafka broker very much, so we don't have point in time recovery. It is secured, but we didn't back it up, for instance. So there's no point in time recovery. If the Kafka broker breaks, then we have to tell all the teams, republish your entities and make them available on the, on the Kafka broker. Um, the producers produce messages in two transactions. The first one is that um, uh, this is because the producer has to make sure that the, uh, that the event or the, the message is really delivered and committed to the, to the Kafka broker. And um, we use intermediate states of this event to, um, to ensure this. So we ha let's have a look at the, um, at the uh, first um, transaction. This is the green one. Um, via the API, a new event is created or updated, and the first thing which happens is in this transaction, we store this event in the, in the main event repository. Um, this is the main place where all those entities um, stay, and we also um, place it into an event repository where we have it for an intermediate time. Um, in the second transaction, the publishing process starts. Um, it publishes to the Kafka brokers, it updates the published version repository and it deletes uh, the intermediate event um, from or the intermediate entity from the event repository. Um, this enables you also to take scheduled jobs to take care of retries if something goes wrong while you produce it, while you publish it to the Kafka uh, jobs, or to clean up the, the repositories um, later on. Uh, the next step we have in our, in our uh, system are the next, next important part are the consumers. And there we say every service can consume every available data and should con consume all the data it needs to fulfill the request. And this is where the subtitle comes from. We think it's better to have the data at request time than trying to get it from another service if the response is already in your service and you have to handle it very fast. Um, the consumer has to process events idempotently, so um, an event can occur multiple times. As I said, if the Kafka broker has some issues, um, all the services will reproduce and the consumers have to handle those duplicated events. Um, so in the infrastructure, we uh, ensure at least once delivery, but this means it can occur multiple times. Um, consumers have to take care of deployment specialities, um, if you use blue-green deployment, um, you might already have, you might already deploy a consumer to production, which shouldn't be active. So you have to think about this. What about the uh, the green version, which is which is not active, which is not getting any traffic? Should it consume already? Uh, should it not? Should it produce other events from this consumption? Should it or should it not? This is something you have to decide um, case by case, and usually we do. <coughs> Two things: um, We either decide that the consumer is not consuming at all and starts consuming when it gets active, or in the end, the consumer is not acting on the consumption. So it fills the database, but it doesn't um, create new events, doesn't uh, do something with this information. Um, the the counterpart for um, for the producers being able to reproduce is um, that all our consumers should be able to reconsume. Um, they should be able to reconsume from the very beginning um, of time in our system. And of course, this um, can be handled if the service crashes and the database fails, which is not the case because there we have backups in place. Um, but um, as Sebastian said before, if you imagine that you consume only the data you need for this specific use case, and in a few weeks someone comes up with another use case, you might need more data. So you have you add another column to your to your entity database, and you need to reconsume everything from the beginning to fill this new column you didn't use before. So this is one of the main reasons to to be able to reconsume. 
Um, consumer is happening in, in one transaction. So this is uh, slightly different. The consumer subscribes to a topic, gets all the messages. Um, it stores um, the entity um, in, inside the entity repository. It stores also the latest processed version um, in a repository where it can, um, uh, this enables the consumers to skip entities which uh, it's, it might have already seen or which is not interested anymore. So um, if you have a lag in there and you get old versions from the, from the, from the producers, um, you, you can just skip them and, can, and uh, keep up to the, to the latest state very fast. Um, if an error occurs, um, the, the data is not written to the entity repository, but to enable, to, uh, to enable the service to move forward in certain cases, the, um, the error is just written to an uh, error repository where it can be handled later, where you can um, have a look at by, on in a manual process or where you can put some tooling on to, to deal with the errors. Okay, so finally we have some source code to, to show for you. Um, first, this is, uh, so this source code comes from a repository where we have at GitHub. I will give you the, the URL later. And this is kind of a, a reference implementation for our employees where they can have a look at if they don't know how to, if, if, they, if they don't know how a good Kafka design looks like. So that's uh, the purpose of this, of this GitHub repo. So this is the uh, domain model. It's pretty easy. You have just a, a domain event with, with, with all the stuff I told you that has an ID, a version, a key, and so on. And embedded in there is a, is a payload, and the payload can be whatever you want. So in this case, in this sample, we have a product payload. So there's a product ID, a name, a price, and so on. And uh, there are just some uh, JPA annotations on there for, for storing them. So when I want to publish these events, um, first thing I do is I check if I already have published this special version of this entity. And if that's the case, and this might happen because we deal with um, at least one uh, delivery in, in Kafka, or at least in our installation we have at least one delivery, it's always a good thing to first look, at, have I already published this event or not? And if, if, that, if, and if that's not the case, then I'll um, go on publishing. Um, the actual publishing happens here. So it's, it's pretty easy. We're using uh, Spring Kafka in this, in this sample. So just publishing event is quite easy. You have to uh, mention the topic, the key, and the, uh, and the uh, JSON document of your, of your event object. And that's it. On the other side, the consumer is a little bit more complicated. This is the actual uh, consumer here. So it's, it's again, it's just a one-liner. It's uh, important thing is this Kafka listener annotation, which says, I will, I will listen to the, to the uh, topic that's, that's stated here. And what I get is a consumer record where all the data is stored in, and an acknowledgment object where you can say, uh, yeah, I've read this. Uh, give me the next one. Uh, then the, the implementation of this method is here, and this is the specialty um, that, we, uh, that we decided to use, which is kind of a best practice for us. So if you um, consume an event, then mainly three things might happen. First thing, everything goes well, that's okay, then you acknowledge and you get the next one. Second thing that might happen is you get an unexpected error, and an unexpected error is something like um, there's, there is some, um, some field missing in your, in your um, JSON, or uh, there are some special encoding characters you might not know, and, and, and something breaks. And in this case, uh, it's, a, it's a good practice to just store this raw event into a special database, and uh, then, then have a look at, at the code and talk to the other people that, that, that has published this uh, topic, and, and talk with them, and, and maybe you have a, a patch or something, and when, you, when you're back up, then you can just empty this, uh, this uh, error database and, and go on. Um, but in, in this case, it's important that you still acknowledge it. So it's, it's just some, some unexpected error. You just store it away, acknowledge, and get the next one, because the next, end, uh, the next event might be, uh, might be OK. The other error that might occur is a temporary error, and that is, for example, if your own database isn't available. Then in this case, you don't want to acknowledge and get the next one, because, it's the, because in, the, um, in, the, in the next second or the next five seconds, your database might not be up again. So in this case, you throw an exception and you don't acknowledge. 
And that's the reason, I can go back to the, to the last slide, we have this uh, retrieval annotation here, which basically says, um, okay, if, if some, um, some, um, some exception bubbles out of this method, we just retry again in 60 seconds, and maybe then the database is up again. Um, then this piece of source code shows how you how you uh, just uh, get get your uh, data back from your from your message. So it's just a simple parsing, and then you check if you already have this version of this entity in your database. So the exact same step the publisher does, the consumer uh, does as well, and only if it's not already in the in the database, then you in the, then you then you go on. And in this case, this is pretty simple. We have two types of, uh, of, uh, of events here, product created, product updated. In this case, we have a, a repository that uh, says uh, just uh, save this product and you go go on. And if, if, the, if the type is not any of this, these both cases, then you have an unexpected error and you have to uh, take care of that. Yeah, and that's basically it. I know that it was a little much in, the, in a short amount of time. This is the, the repo. Uh, you can you can take a picture of that. And we are right now we are quite busy on this on this repository, and um, we are always finding some some new stuff we can can do better, and uh, that we that we learned in the in our production system. And so this is uh, quite under maintenance right now, but it's a good place to look at, and you can just just uh, check it out and start the uh, Docker containers and just have a nice case with. Uh, with a, um, with a service that, pr that uh, produces project, uh, products and another service that displays a product detail page. Okay, so I think we're through. Yeah, that's uh, from our side. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. We will be around at the conference uh, today. We are flying out tonight. And um, at the end of the hallway, there's also a booth of the company, so um, you probably will find us there if there are questions. Um, are there questions right now we, we can handle or we should handle? We have a few minutes left. Yes. So the mic is coming, just a sec. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions, but let's start with the first two. Could you elaborate <laughs> more on the cluster size and how you monitor the Kafka uh, brokers themselves? Uh, again, please. So, how, how we monitor the brokers was one part of the yeah, question. Yeah, and uh, could you elaborate more on the sizing of the Kafka cluster? Or do you have only one cluster or multiple ones for the, all of the services? We have multiple clusters running. Um, I think at the moment the clusters are at a size between 6 and 10 nodes. Um, partition size is around 60 to 100. Um, uh, and we're monitoring um, especially the, the, um, the lack of the messages. Um, we also use Kafka Mirror to, to replicate data from one Kafka to another, so we have a clear separation of those platforms, um, and we get certain topics from one, uh, Kafka to, uh, from one broker to another. Okay, thank you, and last question. Uh, what is the ratio, I mean, between, how many topics do you have per microservice, for example? Uh, Less than 10, I would say. Okay. Thank you. There's one in the back. Um, hello. So I was at your booth, and I've talked with uh, some people, and they told me you're on Google Cloud. So I was wondering, uh, why did you choose Kafka over PubSub? Because it seems that your use cases could be handled by Google PubSub very well in some managed queue? Um, actually, they can't. So um, especially this, uh, this reconsuming things is nothing PubSub enable, en 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 enables you with your services. So the PubSub, la last time I checked, um, has, gives you all the messages from the moment you subscribe, but it doesn't give you historic data because it probably doesn't have historic data. And um, so this would mean if you need the data from the very beginning of time, you create a new service which needs all the customer data or which needs all the order data because you want to run um, analytics on what items the people bought in the past. Um, then the, the way with PubSub would be um, to tell the PubSub service um, to uh, 
or to, to tell the original service, open up a side topic to this, publish everything again on this topic, I will consume it, and uh, then shut down this topic because then I can subscribe to the, to the original or to the official topic. Um, Kafka enables you to subscribe from the very beginning of time. So this was the main reason when we decided to do so. I'm not sure if PubSub changes that way, um, but uh, yeah, this is the main reason. Um, yeah, I think it keeps only for the last seven days events. Uh, so do you have a rough estimation how much time you spend on maintaining Kafka then? Uh, maintaining the broker or maintaining consumers, producers inside the services? Mainly the broker. Um, I think not very much. So I'm not, not an ops guy. Um, we run uh, the Kafka brokers inside the Kubernetes cluster. So they are normal pods inside Kubernetes and uh, go through all the stages when the, when the Kubernetes cluster is updated. They are tiered down, coming up again. Um, and there is no heavy maintenance running. There are some issues when you have breaking changes in the, in the message formats. In, so there is, uh, if you have uh, 0.10 and you want to migrate to 0.11.2, then there might be some changes where you also have to take care on the, on the broker side. But uh, it's not a day-to-day -day business to keep the, the broker running. Thank you. Just take mine one. Thanks. Um, I was thinking, uh, what's the retention period of your Kafka clusters, and why are you having um, a few Kafka clusters at all? And uh, because I saw that you are storing all the events uh, in a separate data store on publishing, and um, yeah. I have an unfunny question. I didn't get the start of the question. Um, was the retention uh, policy of uh, the Kafka clusters, and why do you have uh, a few Kafka clusters? So, what is the retention time in the Kafka cluster? And um, why do we have multiple clusters? Um, retention time, something I can take care of. Um, okay. in, in the area of uh, fulfillment logistics where I'm working, we decided to set the retention time uh, to a very low level. And probably all of you will do the same in, 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 or already had, do the, had done the same. Uh, because of GDPR, we don't want to store data long, ter long term in the Kafka cluster. So the, the compacted things are removed as soon as we can. The retention time in general for, for, for the latest version, I think it's ultimately as long as we need it. So it, it will stay there forever um, until a customer tells us not to store his data anymore or until we don't need the data to fulfill our services. And the second part is why we have multiple cluster brokers running. Yeah. That, uh, that yeah, uh, the main reason for that is because uh, Ansgar stated that we have different platforms. So we have a fulfillment platform, an e-com platform, and big data platform. And we just want these infrastructures to be really separated. And uh, we have only a few topics that two of the platforms need. And, and for that case, we have a mirror that mirrors the um, topics from one broker to another. So uh, we, if, we, if the fulfillment platform goes down, we want our e-commerce platform to still be up and running. So everything is uh, separated and duplicated. Yes, please. First, uh, I would like to thank you for the presentation that you gave. And then the question is, uh, do you have a case where uh, you want to order, or you, want, you want to guarantee ordering for, let's say, different topics or uh, different partitions within one topic? And how do you handle this kind of out of order? Do you have a case? So the like question is, if we have a case where we need consistent order between different topics. Or partitions, yeah. Um, or petitions. Um, right now, I don't have anything in mind um, where we need this case. So as uh, Sebastian said, if you're publishing the, the complete aggregate, um, this is our way um, to avoid handling multiple consumptions from, my, from different topics which need to arrive in the, in the correct order. Um, there might be a case that a service starts filling up the data, data from different sources, but this is usually not done by Kafka. This is done in legacy systems where we ha rely on SOAP or JMS technologies um, where the data comes in different points of time. Then the service has to store the data and produce the event 
only if all data is available. So it waits until everything is there and then it can publish the event. Um, inside the Kafka or um, in the area where we use Kafka, we don't have uh, this situation. Thanks.